Among our tasty treasures are flavorful fruits such as bananas, mangoes, papayas, and of course, the pineapple. This king of fruits was once so rare and valued that it was available only to kings. That is, until about a century ago, when a visionary came to our islands. In 1887, a group of people came to Aiolani Palace, the royal residence in Honolulu, in order to talk to King Kalakaua. These included members of the Reform Party of the Hawaiian Kingdom and the Honolulu Rifles, a private militia. Most of these men could be tied back to the Hawaiian League, a group of wealthy European and U.S. planters who wanted to overthrow the Hawaiian monarchy and get the land annexed by the United States. A meeting was called to order by Sanford Dole and chaired by Peter Cushman Jones, the president of the largest sugar plantation on the islands. Under threat of harm by the militia, King Kalakaua was forced to sign the 1887 Constitution of the Kingdom of Hawaii. This stripped the monarch's powers down to being a figurehead, leaving most to the Hawaiian legislature. They also greatly changed the voting requirements, including foreign aliens, like those white plantation owners, and excluding the Asian population, many of whom previously enjoyed the right to vote. Those who could vote included American, European, and Hawaiian men, so long as they met the economic and literacy requirements. This constitution funneled much of the kingdom's power to the rich, white, foreign upper class, and consequently was never ratified by the Hawaiian legislature. The native population of Hawaii was reasonably displeased with what became known as the Bayonet Constitution, and many petitions were sent to the monarchy to rewrite it. After her ascension to the throne, Queen Lililukalani drafted a new constitution in 1893. It would return many powers to the Hawaiian crown, as well as loosen economic requirements for voting rights, allowing more working class and native Hawaiians legislative participation. Then the Hawaiian League overthrew the entire government. On January 17, 1893, the Honolulu Rifles made an armed garrison of the Adi Aiolani Hale across the street from Aiolani Palace. A proclamation was read, formally deposing Queen Lililukalani and instating a provisional government of Hawaii, naming Sanford Dole as its president. The hostile takeover was aided by a company of uniformed marines and sailors from the USS Boston, asked to come ashore by American diplomat and Hawaiian League conspirator John L. Stevens, who exaggerated reports of Americans feeling unsafe in Honolulu. The marines stationed themselves around the palace, and though they never stepped on the grounds nor fired a shot, their presence rendered the native Hawaiians helpless to the overthrow of their own government. As historian William Russ states, the injunction to prevent fighting of any kind made it impossible for the monarchy to protect itself. President Grover Cleveland recognized the illegal nature of the overthrow, though while he called it an act of war, he did little to rectify the issue other than refuse to annex Hawaii. The colonizers then made Hawaii into an independent republic, keeping Dole as president from 1893 to 1898. That was when Cleveland's successor, William McKinley, would annex Hawaii as a territory, naming Dole as provisional governor. Hawaii would be controlled by the plantation owners until the 1950s when the Democratic Party gained control and started campaigning for statehood. It would be voted in as a state on June 27, 1959. 100 years after the overthrow, the United States Congress passed a resolution signed by President Clinton apologizing to the native Hawaiian people for their involvement. It would be one of very few times the American government formally apologized. Queen Lili Lukalani died on November 11, 1917, after years of failed petitions to the U.S. government for the injustice done to herself and her people, and only a mild monetary recompense from the territory of Hawaii. She was a prolific composer, author, musician, and advocate for Hawaiian culture. She was interred in the Kalakaua crypt in the Memorial Mausoleum of Mana'ala. Her procession and crowds of spectators saying their goodbyes to her by singing Aloha Oi, her most well-known composition. The film footage of her funeral, some of the first of its kind, would be destroyed in a fire in 1921. Sanford Dole got everything he wanted. He resigned as the territorial governor so that President Roosevelt could appoint him as a judge to the U.S. District Court in 1903. He died at home in 1926. He was once quoted as saying, 
The importance of immigration of American farmers as settlers of agricultural lands here is so great to the political and social future of these islands that everything should be done to encourage it and make it successful. And that's just what he did during his leadership. He made it easier for Americans to come to Hawaii and own farms, regardless of who was here before. Such was the case for Sanford Dole's cousin James Dole, who started the Hawaiian Pineapple Company, later known as the Dole Food Company, one of the first to can pineapple and widely spread it among the American mainland. This company is still one of the main distributors of fruit operating today. So, anybody want a Dole Whip? Let's start with full disclosure. I love the tiki room. I love how cheesy and kitschy it is. I love the music and it's fun and cute and it makes me feel like a kid. And I wanted to start with that so that when we get into the critiques, you'll know it's coming from a place of love. So many times when we talk about cultural appropriation, people see it as this personal indictment when the picture is much, much bigger than that. When we think of the term cultural appropriation, as used in today's culture, we most often think of someone like digital influencer Kansas McMayo deciding to wear unfortunate headgear to Coachella. Then her Instagram is filled with detractors, defenders, and people just trying to explain why her fashion choices could be damaging to a marginalized group. While many other great creators have done wonderful videos on the subject, let's get a working definition down for the purpose of this one. People calling out cultural appropriation aren't calling one thing bad. It's not a thing. It's a practice of the bastardization of a marginalized culture from a non-marginalized culture. And we're just pointing that out. It's not about the hair, or the hat, or the food. It's not about you. You're just what's hurting right now. You are as a flea who hops from the bear onto the hiker she just mauled and begins sucking on the open wound. The real pain came before you got there, but you're the one reminding them of it. The sheer force of systemic oppression and erasure is bigger than any one individual decision. This is why it's important for both accusers and defenders to not focus solely on an individual but the environment that allowed them to think it's okay, and the stereotypes and discrimination that are fostered by that environment. There's also a greater onus for corporations to do right with their money and resources rather than that one person who takes cute Instagrams. Which brings me to... There is also a clear economic factor in how cultural appropriation is carried out. In Peter Coffin's video about the subject, he emphasizes how society views culture as a product to be consumed. And very often, the subjugated culture gets no input or financial benefit from their arts and aesthetics being strip-mined for parts. This means they get no say in what aspects become commoditized, such as when war bonnets become commodities even though they have the same cultural significance as the uncommoditized purple heart. And commoditizing culture can even sever the ties between the artifact and the people who originated it, such as when Walmart sticks a dreamcatcher on a choker and calls it festival wear. It is part of the process of decolonialization. This is all about countering the negative economic, ecological, and sociological effects of Western colonialism on other cultures. Implementing that in a way relevant to our subject, it boils down to letting people tell their own stories, rather than people in power telling the stories they think they know about them. There can be gray areas. Two different people, two different cultures, will have two different answers for what is and is not cultural appropriation. Often, this will come down to different perspectives within the influence of colonialism. While Japanese nationals and Japanese Americans might have two different answers as to the offensiveness of, uh, say, Scarlett Johansson as Major Kusanagi, they will also have different relationships to the American culture making that change. One looks from the lens of a culture that took on any Western assimilation almost always on their own terms, and the other looks from the lens of Manzanar. There will be false positives. This is okay. 
Because the issue is less to do with the individual choices and more to do with their societal effects, what might generate a lot of noise may not bring the proper context along with it. Some of you might remember 2018's E3, where Sony showcased the game Ghost of Tsushima with their performance of the traditional Japanese instrument the shakuhachi, played by the non-Japanese musician Cornelius Boots. This raised several concerns of cultural appropriation, but it quickly came to light that Boots was one of the very few virtuosos of the shakuhachi and had studied with the masters in Japan for many years. Problem solved, right? Well, let's take a step back, because maybe the problem isn't who a major corporation hired to play the instrument, but which instruments are chosen for your standard orchestra, and which instruments are a strange, exotic, lost art. I mean, have you ever seen a bassoon? The goal is not segregation, but equity. Let's say, as an abstract example, Kansas McMayo goes and does a cultural exchange in India. She is respectful and open with her host family, and in turn they welcome her and dress her up in a sari, an equal cultural exchange. She takes that sari back to the States and uses it as a conversation piece at house parties, talking about causes important to her and educating her friends about a culture where they have less experience. All good things, all above board. But now say that Kansas works at a tech startup and wears her sari to the office party, for the same reasons she enjoys wearing it at home. This would also be fine, were it not for the fact Kansas's friend Preeti, two cubicles over, has been discouraged from wearing her sari or any of her cultural wear to any work functions because they look unprofessional. In this example, the unfairness stems from the discrepancy in the ways both women are treated, and no matter how good McMayo's intentions may be, it can still be harmful for Preeti due to forces bigger than either of them. The problem is not that a given Kardashian wears boxer braids, is that they get lauded while little black girls are barred from wearing the same hairstyles in school. The goal is not for everyone to stay in their own bubble, but to fix the discrepancy and give the originators their due. Again, decolonialism. If this seems like a lot, it is. It's an academic process, not a blanket call out. I'm laying down all this tedious groundwork so that when I say something like the Enchanted Tiki Room uses cultural appropriation in its depiction of Hawaiian and Polynesian cultures, I am not flatly calling the attraction irredeemable. I am simply asking us to begin the process of examining it, to see what it entails and how it can be improved. So, the Tiki Room uses cultural appropriation in its depiction of Hawaiian and Polynesian cultures, and I'm going to tell you what, but first, some wind. This is the Tonga Hut. It's the oldest tiki bar still operating in the Los Angeles area, founded in 1958. And if you're a perpetual DD like me, they make a mean mocktail, I recommend. But tiki culture as we know it started much earlier. In 1934, a man named Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant took advantage of Prohibition's end and opened a bar in Los Angeles called Don the Beachcomber, even changing his name to match. It was decorated with all his South Pacific souvenirs from Gant's Merchant Marine days, and he would serve elaborate mixtures of rum and fruit juice and pineapples and bamboo cups. It was an astounding success, popular with both celebrities and plebs, eager for the pure escapism of such a novelty. Imitators and rivals began popping up through the late 30s and early 40s, including Trader Vic's in San Francisco, the first tiki bar to franchise. While they were previously a hip West Coast niche, Post-World War II saw a remarkable boom in tiki bars across the United States. GIs returning from the Pacific Theater got a taste for the tropical and found the tiki bars a perfect way to experience it stateside. This was coupled with a massive surge in popularity for Hawaiian culture leading up to its statehood. The first international airport in Hawaii, Daniel Keanoye International, opened in 1953. Even my fellow statesman Elvis Presley got in on the action. For most of the mid-century, if you wanted an exotic dining experience, the Tiki Bar was the place to be. Speaking of dining, Tiki Bars mainly serve Chinese food, thinking that exotic enough to fare for their American patrons, and they actually created a lot of what we consider mainstays in Chinese American food today, like the Crab Rangoon. These are from Panda Express, so nobody wins. At the height of the tiki zeitgeist was born the Enchanted Tiki Room. In the early 60s, Walt Disney and Imagineer John Hinch were brainstorming ideas for a new restaurant in Adventureland that would include a kind of dinner show. 
Walt had an idea for a Chinese establishment with an animatronic Confucius figure in the lobby and a wisecracking dragon in the dining room alongside other performing animals. Thank you, Walt, for changing your mind. John drew concept art that included a dining room decorated with a plethora of tropical birds that Walt had a few reservations about. We can't have birds in there. They will poop on the food. They'll be stuffed birds. Disney does not stuff birds, John. At that point, someone suggested mechanical birds, which prompted Walt to remember a clockwork sparrow on his desk he purchased at a curio shop in New Orleans. This spearheaded the development of audio animatronics, complex enough to perform in the Tiki Room, thanks in large part to Imagineers Harriet Burns, Blaine Gibson, and Mark Davis. Though the restaurant idea was dropped, due to Walt worrying the guests wouldn't leave to make room for the next show, the Enchanted Tiki Room opened to guests on June 23, 1963. It was sponsored by United Airlines until 1976, when another company would come in and sponsor the ride. And from its ubiquitous presence in the 60s, the tiki craze became dated, even trashy by the 70s. Though that swung back around to kitschy fairly quickly, picking up steam in the 90s and is still popular today as a retro throwback. It's even been absorbed into that general beachy vacation aesthetic, the one that multiple beach communities have, even though they don't get much more exotic than sea oats. I mean, that aesthetic felt so communal that another fellow statesman of mine, who frequented the same beach town I did, could absorb Tiki into his visual style as a music performer, and thus bring it into the production design of his restaurant chain. So there is a direct line from Don the Beachcomber all the way down to... <laughs> Here's a fun tidbit for you. The term tiki is actually an archaic term for the Maori people of New Zealand. Tiki was the name of their first human, and so any humanoid carvings after that were called tikis. In Tahiti and Hawaii, where they have similar myths, they're called tii and kii, respectively. And the carvings themselves, they're used to depict deities, uh, venerate ancestors, and mark the entrance to sacred sites. And these are not to be confused with moai, which is another thing tiki bars love to throw around. These are built by the Rapa Nui people of what is now Easter Island. And though they have a similar trajectory, these are massive stone sculptures that are said to house the entire community's ancestors and past kings, and they are watching over their villages to this day. And no matter their specific origin, across Polynesia, these art pieces represent a sacred link to the divine, not unlike the icons of saints. And they also tie modern day descendants to their ancestors. And they remind us all that we are all human together, part of the same family. And we drink booze out of them in these uh, little cups. Sometimes they're shaped like Yoda. Oh, thank goodness I'm gonna need this. And we haven't even begun to talk about Walt Disney's Tiki Room. But I will meet you back there in the next part. It's gonna... it's gonna be a while. Hello and welcome, fan cubs, and thank you so much for watching this video. It was a lot of work, I'm very proud of it, and I'm glad to see it all put out. Big news, I have my own Patreon mainly because of Patreon grandfathering issues. I have my own that is branded separately from Charlie's. And now I'm going to thank my brand new patrons, David Gansel, Ed Vieira, Michael Hamilton, and Alessandra Dreyer. Thank you very much. And for everyone else, you can support by liking, sharing, and subscribing and commenting. And thank you very much. Mahalo and aloha.